and because it shapes the information landscape that we all occupy, it has the ability to impact our jobs. Um, so we need to be aware of it. I'm going to start with this quote from Einstein. Uh, the future is an unknown, but a somewhat predictable unknown. To look to the future, we must first look back upon the past. That is where the seeds of the future were planted. I never think of, of the future. It comes soon enough. Whenever we're confronted with something that maybe seems new, unfamiliar, confusing, I always find it helpful to kind of look back to the past and say, is this something we can compare it to? Is it something we've experienced before? Um, to add a degree of familiarity to it. And if you heard me talk about AI in the past, uh, you would know that I often compare it to the 90s. It, this feels like the 90s to me. Perhaps that's because I entered the librarianship in the 1990s, um, so I have a point of comparison. But in the 90s, there was an impactful technology that arose. In this case, it was the World Wide Web. Uh, World Wide Web, believe it or not, was 1993. Uh, so we're going back just a little over 30 years. And when the internet kind of came into being, uh, became widely available, we had much of the same conversations that we're having today, right? We had people questioning our relevance. Why do I need libraries when I have the internet? Uh, if the World Wide Web was 1993, uh, Google was 1998. So the rise of the modern search engine suddenly was replacing the librarianship. And we know that that conversation came several other times uh, with the rise of eBooks in the 2000s. Why do we need a library? I have eBooks. The internet, much like artificial intelligence, reshapes our information landscape. Think about how much more accessible information became, the democratization of information. Um, but also questions about the quality to it. Just because we had more access to more information didn't mean that the quality necessarily improved. Uh, there was a time when we would tell people if a website was a .edu it was, or a .gov, it meant that you could rely on the information. Now, obviously, the landscape has grown more and more complex since that time. And in the age of AI, when you can ask a chatbot a question and it can pull an answer out of its digital butt and give it to you, yeah, there's more information out there. When there's artificially generated information, there's more info out there, but the quality is not necessarily there, or at least it's more difficult to discern. So we have many of those same uh, you know, conversations that we were having in the 90s. I imagine many of you have lots of really good burning questions about things like copyright. Um, you know, is, can, is AI a violation of copyright? Is generative AI a violation? Um, when I create something, can I copyright it? Is it public domain? What does it mean? And we had many of these same questions and concerns in the 1990s with the rise of the internet. The, I don't know the statute of limitations, I'm not here as a lawyer, but I imagine some of you may have used things like Napster and LimeWire or had that type of activity going on at your organizations, right? And patrons were doing stuff and you had questions, is this legal, is this illegal, what does it mean? Um, questions about, you know, how do you cite something on the internet? Um, is it cheating using the internet uh, from an academic standpoint? So we had those questions then as we do now. The other thing is, it probably feels like we're in this kind of uh, overhyped environment, right? There's a bit of a gold rush when it comes to artificial intelligence. Lots of new products being developed, lots of excitement, also lots of fear. And in the 90s, there was the dot-com bubble. There were companies that would just mention the internet in their business model just to seem cool. There were lots of companies that <clears throat> were birthed of the internet. And they rose, they fell, they grew in valuation, they came, they went, they disappeared. Eventually, the bottom fell out. But just because the bubble burst didn't mean the internet went away. And we're seeing some of that same churn now. A company like OpenAI could be worth billions of dollars, then maybe trillions of dollars, then maybe they fire their CEO, then maybe their CEO is back with more power than ever. Um, there's a lot of churn, um, but just because there's hype, there's this churn doesn't mean that the age of AI is a fleeting one. It is certainly a consequential technology. 
and I suspect one that's here to stay. The internet in the 90s was also one where initially it was nerd stuff. A lot of people didn't understand it. If you had an email address, you were a nerd, um, you were super techie. But we know that eventually it became user friendly. It was a movement towards widespread adoption. The ease of use improved. And now it's the air we breathe. Now we notice the internet when the Wi-Fi goes out. Um, otherwise, it's just something we deal with in our day to day. You can expect artificial intelligence to take a similar path. Right now, it's poorly understood. It can often be difficult to use. Um, it's moving towards ease of use. It's moving towards more wide acceptance, towards being built in to common software. And less and less it will be the thing of nerds and more it will be uh, very common and easy to use. I'm gonna take you all the way back uh, in a time machine 30 years ago to the year 1994. This is the Today Show. Back now at 56 past, I wasn't Oops, prepared to translate that as I was doing that little tease. Oh, that's that right. little mark with the A and then the ring around it. At? See, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. um, Katie said she thought it was about. Yeah. Oh. But I'd never heard or it. I'd never heard it said. Back. I'd always seen around. the mark, but never yeah. heard it said. And then yeah. it sounded stupid when I said it. Violence at NBC. <coughs> yeah, well, I heard something around big fight up in the lunchroom the other See, week. <laughs> there it is. Violence at NBC, GE com. I mean, well, what well, Allison should know. What, what do you is say internet about anyway? Internet is uh, that massive computer right. network, mm -hmm. the one that's becoming really big now. What it's, do you mean? That's big. What, how does one? Not, what do you write to it like mail? No, a lot of people use it and communicate. It, I guess they. So, World Wide Web was 1993. One year later, 1994, you have reasonably intelligent people having a conversation about the internet. And you can see how it was still poorly understood, how email wasn't widely understood or in use. Um, but we know that just a few short years after this point, our libraries began having digital presences. We've had things like websites. I'm gonna go four years okay, ahead. Okay. This is the year 1998. This is my first library. The uh, Mastix Marisha Shirley Community Library in the year 1998. And you can tell we were early adopters of the internet because we got a really sweet domain name, communitylibrary.org. And you look and you can see how we had uh, online uh, access to our library records, how you could search the catalog. We had things like web rings where we gathered information, reference databases online. It became an integral part of the library experience just a few years later. If you ever doubt your library's ability to have kind of adapted and adopted technology, just go to the Wayback Machine and search your domain or search your library's name, and you can see, looking back at past iterations of your website, just a history of, of innovation, of adapting to technological change. So yes, technology changes. It can be quite disruptive. It can come at you fast, but we have a long and storied history of proving naysayers wrong about the, the um, viability of the library and making these technologies integral to the library experience. For 1998, this is a pretty great website. Um, I would say it's the bomb.com, uh, the bomb diggity. It is um, cool beans. You can throw in your favorite, favorite 90s slang in here. This was a good website for its day. And again, to my point, the libraries have a long and storied history of adapting to technological change. 1980s, it was the computer. 90s, it was the internet. In the 2000s, we saw the rise of mobile technology, of the smartphone, of the iPhone in 2007, um, the iPad in 2009, 2010. We saw that the internet, and just as computers, you know, kind of uh, evolved over time to integrate with the internet to become mobile devices. Well, the internet also aged and had things like social media, like cloud computing, the metaverse, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality in the 2010s. And now as we enter into the 2020s, we're into the age of AI. So you can look to the past to find similar times that we have 
you know, uh, dealt with an, a very disruptive technology. You can also look to the past to see a history of success in adapting to technological change. Now, the current AI discourse can be unhelpful. Um, maybe it's just the time we live in, but you know, there's lots of hot takes, uh, good and bad, about artificial intelligence. Oftentimes, to be heard, you have to be the loudest voice in the room. And I don't always find that the dialogues we have are helpful. I'm going to just lay it out there and kind of tell you what, where I'm coming from with this technology, what my biases may be. And I am not an alarmist. I'm not a prophet of doom saying it's the worst thing ever. I'm not a tech bro that's uh, you know here to try to sell you NFTs and is super excited about artificial intelligence and thinks it's the best thing ever. I think it is a technology with incredible capacity for good and bad, and it's very much how it's wielded and what the use cases are. Um, and really, my my goal today is not to tell you you know, AI is good or bad, it's to tell you what it is, warts and all, show you how it's impacting our organizations, give you some information so that we can all make just informed decisions uh, about this. And I think the best thing you can do is see with your eyes, touch with your hands, understand the good and the bad, and then determine what comes next as this technology comes. But understand that it's a technology that is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. And the question more or less is not that, you know, do we use AI? Do we not use AI? It's how do we prepare ourselves for this new environment where AI is present? Again, hype cycle. This is a 24 hour period of my uh, Twitter or X feed from a bunch of folks I don't follow who tell me that there's 120 new mind blowing tools, uh, a thousand new AI tools, no 500 AI tools, no uh, PowerPoint is you know, uh, old hat, you don't need it anymore. I could be making $5,000 a day using uh, that GPT. Yes, there's a gold rush. Yes, there's a hype cycle. But we also need to understand that, again, bad tech takes are not new. I can go back into the 90s, and I have this great article I found from Newsweek, The Internet, bah. Uh, this is 1995. And this is somebody who thinks that the internet is overhyped. And they say that visionaries uh, see a future of telecommuting workers, interactive libraries, and multimedia classrooms. They speak of electric town meetings and virtual communities. Commerce and businesses will shift from offices and malls to networks and modems. And they say this all dismissively, thinking this is hype. And you can see in this instance, they, they undersold what the internet was capable of. On the flip side, this is Byte Magazine on the right here. The year is 1998, and they have the Year 2000 Survival Guide for uh, Y2K, warning you to start building that bunker. Um, it's all going to fall apart. So it is possible both to underestimate the potential of a technology and also overestimate maybe its disruptive effect. And we can see that with AI in the present. You have a fired Google engineer who's insistent that the Google AI had become self-aware. Uh, he also, a few weeks later, determined that uh, the Bing's chatbot also was sentient based on stuff he read online. Um, obviously, that's not the case. You have folks who overestimate the capacity of AI. You have a gentleman uh, influencer on Twitter or X who's suggesting that maybe you can get rid of your psychologist and instead train ChatGPT to function as your psychologist. Listen, I am not a medical professional, um, but I can confidently say, don't do that. That's a bad idea. And then you have your prophets of doom telling you that there's creaky, creepy robots that want to destroy humankind. Now, Part of this unhelpful dialogue has to do with timing, and timing is everything. It's understandable why this is maybe not the best time for artificial intelligence for another great disruptive event. We're coming on the heels of a pandemic. We're still trying to get through it. Um, you know, you had a once in a century public health crisis, and then three years later, we're told that we have another once in a century disruptive event, in this case, the age of AI. That seems a little unfair. You know, once in a century is not supposed to happen twice in three years. 
libraries are experiencing limited funding. We're getting squeezed with our digital collections, which are becoming prohibitively expensive. The model doesn't necessarily work from a pricing standpoint. Rapid digitization of services. We're trying to serve two very different patron types, transactional folks that want to use online or grab and go and, you know, uh, very quick. We have in-person users who like personalized service and all the hand-holding. And this is also a time when libraries are under attack. We are simultaneously one of the most respected public, you know, uh, organizations, uh, civic organizations, uh, at the same time that libraries are also under attack by the forces of censorship. Um, we're now in the culture wars. So not a great time for disruption. Earlier, I showed you some past experiences as a way of relating the unfamiliar to the familiar. Look at the uh, age of AI in the context of the 90s. But another way to make it a little more understandable, of course, is to define it. So let's define artificial intelligence. What is AI? Well, a good definition is that it's a technology that leverages computers and machines to mimic the problem solving and decision making capabilities of the human mind. That mimicry is the stuff that's both exciting and sometimes you know, uh, upsetting for folks. It's the idea that it can do things like process language, like a person would process language. You'll hear terms like neural network. It's mimicking how we think, predict, um, process information. There are four types of AI two of which are actually current and in existence, and then two that are theoretical. Reactive machines and limited memory, those are actually real things, and then theory of the mind and self-aware, which are all progressively scarier and more theoretical. Reactive machines are only capable of using its intelligence to perceive and react to the world in front of it. Now, Deep Blue is a good example. Deep Blue is a supercomputer that uh, famously beat a chess grandmaster. Um, but what it did was just make the best decision giving the information directly in front of it, the best move it could make in the present. That'll get you far in life. But now we're seeing the rise of limited memory AI, and that's artificial intelligence that has the ability to store previous data and predictions when gathering information and weighing potential decisions. And I'll show you how that's made. Imagine if we were making a medical AI. I'd start with training data. Things like the New England Journal of Medicine, things like um, WebMD could potentially make up its training data. I create the machine learning model, the algorithm, that piece that connects the user to the information that parses the data make sure that the model can make predictions, and I make sure that it can receive human or environmental feedback. Human feedback in the situation would be the questions I ask it, the answers I give as a person. The next piece though is what makes us concerned about artificial intelligence, particularly in a library context, and that is that it stores the human and environmental feedback as data. It takes your questions and that information and it becomes part of the training model and it gets fed back into the model as a cycle. The confidentiality of patron records are important to us. The nature of a reference question that, that doesn't become part of a public record is important to us. And so that is one of the things we need to be concerned about with things like ChatGPT, um, its ability to take that information and feed it back into a system. You know, that's also a limit on free inquiry. Um, you're less likely to ask a question if it can be traced back to you. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on theoretical AI um, because basically it's theoretical and we have bigger problems with uh, sentient AI, right? Um, <laughs> but theory of the mind is that kind of path towards sentience, right? It's that AI understands that people have thoughts and feelings and emotions that affect their behavior and it can adjust to match. And then self-aware is, you know, you can drop your favorite uh, science fiction movie or book into the chat and I'll have a nice reading list for later. But that's where AI possesses human level consciousness and understands its own existence in the world, as well as the presence and emotional state of others. 
that's your iRobot uh, or the movie Her or any number of uh, different sci-fi uh, stories. You may have heard a lot about LLMs, large language models. That's a term that refers to AI models that can generate natural language text from large amounts of data. These models, they use deep neural networks. Those are computers that are meant to simulate the human mind to learn from billions or trillions of words and to produce text on any topic or domain. Think chat GPT. You type in a question, it goes through that large language text that it has all that data and it spits out an answer, right? Um, on that topic or domain. It is predictive in nature. It is also, um, it uses probabilistic math. And what I mean by that is, if you've ever used autocomplete, when you're typing an email and it guesses what words come next, it's using prob probability. It uses that and it uses it to such an extreme case that it can do not just the next word or sentence, but paragraph. Um, when you understand it like this, though, that's why you maybe shouldn't put so much credence in the, uh, the information it gives you. It's just saying the most likely thing, and it tends to equate popularity with correctness as a result. And then there's generative AI, which is kind of a large umbrella, um, but that's artificial intelligence capable of generating text, images, or other media in response to prompts. If I use something like uh, Midjourney, I type in a text prompt and it gives me an image based on the text instructions I gave it. I, uh, Google has software that can make music based on text prompts. ChatGPT takes your text and it gives you text back. And then finally, any talk we have about artificial intelligence needs to include algorithmic bias. You may have heard that AI is biased. And when we say algorithmic bias, we're talking about systematic and repeatable errors that create unfair outcomes, such as privileging one arbitrary group of users over others. Technology is not neutral. We oftentimes, if we're making mistakes with AI, one of the big mistakes is that we think of it as a neutral arbiter, that the AI is above the fray, um, that it's not emotionally involved, that it has all the data, and it's making a pure, correct decision. But it's powered by people. We give it the training model. We set the parameters to it. It learns from us, and we're inherently biased in different ways. So no, AI is not neutral. There are plenty of examples of groups that can be, you know, uh, um, receive an unfair outcome. And let's give an example that's a little bit meta. This software like Turnitin. Now Turnitin is well-intentioned software that is AI detection. It checks to see if a paper submitted by a student is written by AI, for example. And there have been tests that have shown that it tends to overwhelmingly flag writing by speakers of other languages where English is not their first language um, as being AI generated. It's a false positive that consistently happens. Things like ChatGPT tend to have a gender bias. Its default setting seems to think that a doctor is a man uh, and a nurse is a woman, for example. And then you have text to image. Um, if you describe you know, uh, different things, it tends to give you very cliched, uh, stereotypical images of what a prisoner looks like, what a CEO looks like. Um, and that is a problem as well. Here on the right, you see an example. This is Rona Wang. She was a recent graduate. She used an AI-powered app where she took a photo of herself and asked it to make her headshot look more professional. So there she is on the left, and she appears to be a, an Asian woman. On the right is the output, and it basically turned her into a white girl with blue eyes um, because that was the characteristics deemed more professional, at least um, in terms of algorithmic bias. You can see that played out. Now, AI is already impacting our libraries. We often talk about artificial intelligence as it's something that's coming, uh, you know, kind of that Paul Revere moment. The British are coming. 
like we're warning people that AI is coming, we need to prepare. But in reality, AI is here, it's been here for a while. Um, you know, it, it's a subtle technology, so we don't always see it. Some of the early ways it's impacting our libraries is on the, our collections and collection development. Just the marketplace itself now, there are AI authored books increasingly. Um, Amazon recently had to make a rule now where um, you can only publish three books a day on Amazon. Obviously that was aimed at limiting the amount of AI generated content on their site. Um, with a three book a day limit, the only human author that's probably impacted would be uh, James Patterson. He may have to slow down a little bit. We're also seeing the rise of AI narrated audiobooks. And when we talk about the good and the bad of AI, this is a great example. Um, audiobooks are very expensive. They are in increased demand. I'm sure if you look at your digital collections, the circulation numbers, the audiobooks are growing at an exponential rate. Not every book gets made into an audiobook. In fact, it tends to be the bestsellers. It tends to be maybe some of the high interest nonfiction popular biographies. But there's a whole bunch of stuff that never gets an audiobook especially indie stuff. Audiobooks can be a really accessible option for many of our patrons. There is now a growing amount of AI narrated audiobooks that they sound really good. It's not the robotic stuff that we're used to, that text to speech that we've all heard before. That's concerning if I'm a narrator, right? That impacts my livelihood. But it also for the consumer, for the user, it potentially has more audiobook content out there. For the buyer, it's potentially much more affordable. So that's the good and the bad that we see oftentimes with AI. Um, not to sound crass, but there tends to be winners and losers when there's disruption. AI is impacting our collection development platforms. Um, you know, it has the ability to functionally have read a book. So now you're getting better metadata. It's not just Library of Congress subject headings, but it's that granular detail um, the tone of a book, the emotion behind it. These types of things also now you're seeing platforms that can do really great collection development assessments and they can do things like diversity audits. But the same things that can be used for inclusion can be used for exclusion and we're seeing AI used now. Not this isn't theoretical, it's being used as a tool of censorship. Mason City Schools in Iowa started using ChatGPT to give parameters to it to determine what books they ought to ban um, and are using that. Book challenges now are being authored by AI. Um, oftentimes our material challenges, we ask for things like, hey, did you read the book? Um, now folks can have AI read the book and issue a challenge. We're also in a new age where ownership doesn't really exist anymore. With digital content, you don't own the thing. You have no right to first sale like you do with a print book. It's licensed software. And companies like Amazon have a history of altering or even removing content that you've purchased from an e-reader um, you know, when things change. Uh, famously, Roald Dahl. Some of the language didn't age very well in his books. They changed the words in the digital copy without your permission and altered what was already in your e-reader. Imagine censorship paired with this lack of ownership for us and you can see where the concern may lie. Now, a lot of this stuff is gonna be the new tools of the trade. Um, a web search is a big part of what we do, right, in the day-to-day. -day. And now we have conversational search, whether you're searching a database, whether you're searching the internet, you have the rise of things like BARD and Bing and uh, Gemini and uh, all sorts of AI tools. You have the rise of LLMs from your database companies where you're going to not use Boolean anymore. You're going to talk to it like you talk to a person because AI does natural language processing. The pandemic, for many of us, was the first time that we worked in collaborative work environments where we used Office 365 or Google Workspace in a really big way. 
AI is already powering these tools. It's coming to things like Windows 11. It's coming to things like, um, you know, uh, Adobe, um, Adobe Creative Suite, Canva. A lot of software that we use has generative AI. So it's impacting the very tools that we're already using. And then, of course, there's vendor solutions which are coming. You may have been approached by vendors already. And we need to get ahead of this so that we can be in a position of assessing, are these good tools, are they bad? What do I need to be concerned with? Um, is this appropriate or not? When an EBSCO or Elsevier comes to you and tries to sell you a thing. Very quickly, I'm gonna do a spotlight, a spotlight on BARD. Now, Google tends to move quickly. They tend to drop products, rename products. There's already talk that BARD is going to just be called, uh, be replaced by Gemini, but functionally, we have a conversational search. It's AI powered search. Um, I was hungry when I did this. So I am searching, I am looking for restaurants in downtown Cleveland. I prefer Italian restaurants. I would like them to offer a gluten-free menu. So I've put in multiple queries into one search, right? Google has come back with several different uh, restaurants it suggested. Now remember there's limited memory. So it remembers my query so I can do a follow-up question to it. So I wanna make sure that they serve Pepperdell. Um, my Italian ancestors are howling at my pronunciation of that. But now I've offered a specific dish that I want and part of this gluten-free Italian um, in downtown Cleveland. It's now limited me to three options and given me detail uh, and links to the actual content. So it's scraping that information right from the web in real time, right from their menus. And I'm adding a final piece here. My budget for two people for dinner is $80. Uh, I had to hesitate. I have kids, so I don't get to eat out very often. So I had to remember what does a night out actually cost? <laughs> um, and it has given me three options, one of which it cautions may be a little too expensive. So you see, I'm not using Boolean. I'm able to put multiple questions into one search. I'm able to offer clarification um, and that limited memory follows me for this. I can return to this search. So as a tool of pre-research, that can be very helpful. And then there's ChatGPT, which I think is best understood when we do a brainstorming session. Uh, here on the left, you'll see I kind of have an outline of how I like to approach it. That is with context, task, instruction, clarify, and refine. I think our youth services librarians oftentimes get left out of the conversation in the AI. So I am putting, you are a children's librarian in a public library, that's the context. You are planning a dinosaur themed story time and craft program for school aged children. That is the instruction. I need five program titles. And then the clarification, do you understand? It says, of course it understands. It gives me five program titles. Dino Tales and Crafty Adventures, Jurassic Journeys, Stories and Crafts, on it goes. I am now going to refine. Same thing, limited memory. I'm gonna ask it, can you make these titles sound more exciting? And now Dino Tales becomes Dynamite Adventures, Stories and Mega Crafts, Jurassic Journey Extravaganza, Roaring Stories and Epic Crafts, and on we go. Now, I wanna spotlight a few things here. One of which is we have a tendency to ask questions when we don't know the answer, right? That's just human nature. But with AI, you have to understand it as a tool, not as a source. When I'm using a tool, it's helping me direct me towards information, but I have to be able to assess it. I have a background as a children's librarian. So I'm asking questions that I am in a position to exercise quality control. If it gives me a program name that's wildly inappropriate, I can say, no, um, that doesn't work. That's not age appropriate. That's not what we do. I can steer the conversation. I'm not asking it for a medical diagnosis that I have no idea where it's getting the information from, um, that not, I'm not in a position when it gives me bad info, it, or if it hallucinates and makes something up, 
that I don't know, that I'm, I am lost and I am just wholly um, trusting the system. So when you think of it as a productivity tool, when you think of it as a brainstorming or as an augmentation or as an enhancement, AI oftentimes becomes less threatening and more, again, more of a tool, not a source, something that you wield that doesn't wield you. Now, AI is a disruptor, but disruption is our business model as libraries. Our public libraries, we have a long and storied history of when something like the internet comes out and shakes up the job market, we help upskill our communities, we help explain how the technology works. Our academic and school libraries, our special libraries, when the nature of information changes, the format of it changes, um, how we access and interact with it changes, we update, we become web-based, we become interactive, um, we adopt things like augmented reality. Um, so yes, disruption change is scary, it's upsetting, it's annoying. Um, it's annoying being bad at something again that you were previously good at and then you have to learn. But we have always done well with disruption. Our schools, our universities, we prepare our students for the workforce as the workforce changes. And so AI is this new disruptor and disruption is our business model. One of the big ways it's a kind of a disruptor is in their information space. It is a big information and media literacy challenge. Information literacy, media literacy um, is not taught consistently in our schools in K through 12. Information literacy previously was just one state. I think we're up to three states that are now mandating K through 12 information literacy classes. Uh, we have a lot of catching up to do. We know that we're already poor consumers of information. I love this Jonathan Swift quote. Um, we're going back into the uh, you know uh, 1700s here. Falsehood flies and truth comes limping after it so that when men come to be undeceived, it is too late, the jest is over and the tale hath had its effect. The age of fake news, um, the age of social media. He could have written this five years ago, right? And we are now in what I like to call the era of code your own reality. Um, if you wanna see it, you can make it. This is a piece of fake news, a fake image. Um, this is, I'm on mid journey. It's a text to image generator. I enter a text prompt. This is real time, okay? Uh, Joe Biden, selfie in front of the Eiffel Tower. Um, to my knowledge, Joe Biden has never taken a selfie in front of the Eiffel Tower. The full length of this video is one minute and 10 seconds, and that is how quick it takes to make a face, fake, but visually passable piece of fake news. Most text image generators give you four images, um, which you can then make for, uh, variations of any one of the four, or you can upscale any one of the four. In this case, I'm going to upscale one of the images in uh, the lower left-hand corner. This is an old screen recording, um, but in real time. And there you have it. Um, we live in an era where fake news is easier than ever to make. Uh, where we have the means of creation with artificial intelligence and we have the means of distribution with social media. Um, this is a fairly innocuous image, but we're in a time where we're entering into an election cycle where there are wars in the Middle East, there are wars in Ukraine, um, where the information warfare that's happening is very much a 21st century war. Now, sometimes it feels like, man, how are we going to, you know, uh, learn these new AI powered skills? But a lot of this discerning of, of fake news, of, of being careful consumers inf of information is still very traditional. Um, we don't need all the newest skills. A lot of it is just taking a moment 
and applying some really simple standards. Um, in an age of text to image generators and deep fakes and social media distribution, we also have to recognize that part of the problem is us, um, is that we have a need for immediacy. We want to know right away. Think about, if we go back to the 90s, how long it took for a web page to load, and think about how frustrated you get today if you have to wait three seconds for a website to load. Think about how when you perform a search, be it social media or on, um, on the internet, you can sort by date, you can sort by time, you can see the most recent, you can see posts in real time. And misinformation typically operates in that space between like a formal understanding and you know uh, what's dropping right away. It's that gap between established information. So our need for immediacy is kind of puts us at a disadvantage sometimes. That's where librarians come in. We can still apply those old school standards uh, like the CRAAP test, currency, reliability, accuracy, authority, purpose. Um, we can still do things like reverse image searches. Good site to look at is the News Literacy Project. Um, they are in the process of kind of looking at news literacy in the age of AI. Um, so they're learning at the same time we all are. Uh, when you see something like these images that popped up on Twitter, does it pass the crap test? Um, you know, if I had taken those images on the left of former President uh, Trump getting beat up by the NYPD, a reverse image search would have told me that that very provocative image was actually originated on a Twitter account called But Crack Sports. Um, is that a reliable source of information? I would say But Crack Sports does not have a long and storied history of journalistic integrity. That's a good thing to say like, whoa, maybe I shouldn't trust that image that just popped up. Um, just applying common sense is an image of the Pentagon being bombed. This was widely spread on Twitter. Regardless of your feelings about media bias, I think we can all agree that the big bias has always been sensationalism. And certainly any media source, left, right, is going to cover an attack on the Pentagon. So the fact that no news source, no established news source had covered it is a good um, indicator that it's fake. When we talk about disruption and the disruptive effect of AI, we also need to understand that digital equity is our thing. This isn't new for us. Um, to understand digital equity, just think of you know, having an internet connection and the hardware and software that you need to fully participate in society. That is very much a moving target. Five years ago, for me, that meant I just had an you know, uh, internet connection where, and my smartphone so I could check my email and keep in contact with work. Two years ago, digital equity for me meant that I had a computer for myself so I could work from home in a fully um, virtual environment um, in Google Workspace. I could have Zoom calls with multiple people that I had a Chromebook for my daughter so she could go to school virtually, um, that all my shows that stream were on TV, uh, or all my uh, TV shows stream now, so I needed a connection to be able to stream all that. My, my needs suddenly increased quite a bit uh, in terms of digital equity. Full participation changed quite a bit. AI is a digital equity issue. Right now, it's a bit of a strange thing that AI tools are widely available and oftentimes free, that a lot of people can use text to image generators for free. They can use chat GPT for free. Um, but they're figuring out the business model and eventually they'll be paid and free versions of these things. They already are, but increasingly you'll be priced out of access as an individual. There'll be an economic burden that'll be imposed. There'll be the haves and have nots. There'll also be a disparity in the quality of AI models. Some of the paid ones may be better and the library can provide access as a service. Think about the database arguments we had back in the 90s where folks didn't understand the difference between a web search and a search on a database that had actual, you know, like 
there was often a physical magazine or a book or journal behind it all uh, where we understood the provenance of the information. Well, we'll be seeing databases that are LLMs where we have some quality control on the information there. And that will be one of the uh, selling points is that it's better information. It's not just garbage or made up stuff. When we think about media literacy, media literacy isn't just about consuming information, it's also about the creation of information. And with AI, if we understand the algorithmic bias that exists, we understand how the images that can be created can be problematic. We need to have diverse AI authorship. We need folks that look and think differently creating um, so that it's more reflective of the broad spectrum of people. And the library providing a safe environment for experimentation for learning is gonna be an important thing there. This can't be what we offer our patrons. You may have heard of the term black box AI. And functionally what that is, let's take ChatGPT as an example. So the input, that's my question. I asked ChatGPT a question. It goes into the black box. That is the training model. What is it made up of? I don't know, some snapshot of the internet from uh, 2021. What is the algorithm? How does it connect me to the information? I also don't know that. It's part of the black box, it's a mystery. Then the next thing I know is the answer, the output, what comes out of it. But I don't know the provenance of the information. I don't know how it arrived at that. I don't know the accuracy of it. This can't be what we offer patrons. This is informational malpractice, I think we can agree. We need to provide glass box AI, where people know what the training model is made up of, what the algorithm looks like, where is it getting the answers from, what is the information composed of, what are the sources. And this is a time where we should be experimenting. Hands-on is key. Many of us have things like makerspaces because we understand the importance of experiential learning, of learning by doing, of getting hands-on. It's also important because experimenting, even if we don't settle on those exact tools, it gives us an opportunity to understand the functionality, how a thing works, what does conversational search look like, what does prompting look like, because these things are coming to common software. Windows 11 has its co-pilot feature, so generative AI tools are coming to Windows. When you use something like Microsoft Publisher, you'll describe to it the template that you want. You can have it summarize emails and documents. So generative AI, it's coming. Natural language processing, LLMs, large language models. It's all gonna be packaged in the software that we use in our day to day. And to hit the ground running, we should have a sense of how these tools work. I mentioned also Yes, it's a gold rush and people are looking to make money and you are going to be approached by traditional library vendors and some new ones that have a new, a new product that you just can't live without, a new chatbot, a new um, large language model, a new database. And you wanna be able to say, hey, that's good or hey, that's bad or ask good questions or say, hey, don't I already have that same functionality on this free tool over here? So understanding how this stuff works um, will make a good point of comparison so you can critically evaluate these pay tools that are coming. And then of course, we're not just learning for ourselves, we're learning so we can turn these skills outward, so we can train our fellow staff, so we can train you know, uh, other educators uh, in a school setting or our students, um, you know, our university students, our other faculty, our colleagues, our patrons, we learn so that we can turn these skills outwards towards our community, towards our users. Reskilling is not new for libraries. Uh, my public libraries out there, age of the internet, I'm sure you help people learn how the computer works, how the internet works, how to get a resume online, how to do a modern job search. Um, Undoubtedly, when the internet came, it disrupted the job market. Folks who had a job found those jobs were gone and they needed to reskill. Um, 
for our folks in the academic environment, this is really tough because this is happening in real time. So the job market potentially has changed. The necessary skills have changed in midstream for us. Small businesses are very interested in AI, both as an opportunity, but also as a perceived threat. And they need to understand well, to what degree are they at risk. And libraries have a long history of working with the business community, both as a pipeline and getting folks trained up so they can enter the job field, uh, the job market, both as working as small business engines, um, teaching, you know, again, if you harken back to the age of the internet, how to have a website, how to do social media marketing. So this is important. Many of you have a smartphone. Uh, Pew Research would say about 90% of you have a smartphone. I imagine you did not go to iPhone University. You did not go to iPad University. You did not go to Android University. You learned by doing. That was a disruptive technology, but you learned by getting hands-on. And we are that figure-it-out generation where this is dropped on us for many of us when we're not in school, where there's no formal education for this. But all of this reskilling, while it's a new technology, it's a similar role for us as in the past. So why am I hopeful? Um, I am generally a cynic, if you know me, okay? I am not uh, kittens and rainbows, but on this slide, I am kittens and rainbows, albeit AI-generated kittens and rainbows. For starters, the information landscape has just grown more complex. Is that a frustration? Sure. Is it a challenge? Yes. But we're information specialists. We are all about finding accurate information on vetting information, on guiding users and teaching them search strategies. And so if the volume of information has increased and probably not the quality, right, it's more difficult to discern accurate information, that makes us more necessary than ever. We are also trusted sources of information. We have a long and storied history of guiding our public through disruptive technology of having their trust. I mentioned none of us went to iPhone school, right? iPhone University. Our patrons come to us looking for tech help. They could go to the Genius Bar at the Apple Store, but they come to us because they like the personalized service, because we have their trust, because we're not here to sell them anything. And that's how we differentiate ourselves from big tech. We're not here to make a buck. We actually respect your privacy. So these are all check marks in the library column in the age of AI. And we're well positioned to navigate the age of AI. Um, we have the internet connection. We have the tech savvy staff. We have the history of being able to do this. Um, we have the necessary skills to vet information. Yes, we'll need to learn new skills in the age of AI, but many of the traditional ones work very well in this new, um, this new landscape. This is also an exciting time. As much as it's you know, a lot of churn and we all hate change, we are on the ground floor of a new technology. And this gives us the opportunity to lean into it, not to engage in AI avoidance, but rather to point out where the technology is problematic, to get hands on, to understand it, to take a lead role in educating our communities, to serve as AI navigators, to get a seat at the table when decisions are being made on regulation. Um, it's important and that requires us to lean in, not to run away. We should, and it is necessary, to point out ethical issues, algorithmic bias, privacy concerns, there's environmental impacts to be, to be uh, reckoned with. But we need to be able to present an ethical alternative of AI. Yes, the technology is useful in some instances. There are good use cases, there are bad use cases. What does appropriate use look like? Articulate that to our communities um, because that's where the opportunity lies. It doesn't lie in avoidance. It lies in, if not perfecting, improving the product. The other thing that's a frustration is there's no guardrails, right? Right now, it's the Wild West. Uh, it's a widely unregulated space, um, which 
if we look at the history of unregulated spaces, there tends to be problems with that. We've all read Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. Uh, usually it's not a happy story. But our libraries are our own little fiefdoms, and we do have the opportunity to have these ethical debates and then articulate that vision as policy, uh, because we know that legislation happens slowly. We can devise rules and procedures um, that ensure certain quality, certain protections for our users, uh, for our staff, that add clarity to an unclear situation within our organizations. The other thing is the work that we do is valuable. AI can replace work that needs to be understood. I think it's intellectually dishonest of me to say like AI can do all sorts of stuff, um, you know, even as a productivity tool, right? If AI can do the work and can help me do the work of two people, that calls into question, does that result in job loss? Um, but that is entirely a decision that's made by organizations, by communities, because libraries suffer from mission creep all the time. We always have more work than we have hours in the day. At my own library, we're trying to engage in more outreach, which is super time intensive. We're trying to engage in more customer uh, facing services, one on one appointments, all that hand holding that takes a lot more time. Um, so if we look to the 90s, did the internet cost jobs? It definitely replaced some work, didn't it, in library land? It definitely, tech processing wasn't a growth industry for libraries, but we invested in new areas in libraries. So yes, it can replace work. It doesn't have to replace workers. It is, however, a communication challenge because there are people out there saying, why do I need libraries? Why do I need librarians when there's AI? just as they did with the rise of the internet, just as they did with the rise of Google, just as they did with the rise of eBooks and digital content. This is once again, a communication challenge that we'll have to engage in. We're trying to serve two very different patron types, some of whom are transactional, who wanna to talk to a robot and get the information as quickly as they can. And those folks who treasure, especially coming out of a pandemic, the personal, the conversational, the taking it slow. So that is an opportunity. This is my contact information. Um, happy to take questions. I know that there were some questions that were submitted. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, there's one question that was submitted through the Q&A um, that you briefly touched on, but if you would like to expand, it says what AI tools exist to assist in collection development? And are there any that are doing a good job at things like diversity audits? Sure. Some of it is just existing tools that are becoming improved because they have access to better metadata. Functionally, whereas in the past, you were kind of reliant on uh, Library of Congress subject headings. Um, you now have these systems that functionally are able to have almost like read the book. So it's just the things you're using are already improved. Then there are tools, um, you know, one that I've uh, seen is like library IQ that functionally can really get granular about different, um, different subjects, different topics, different areas for collection development. Okay, there's another question about um, a liability policy for the library. Uh, will you need to have a, li a library liability policy um, to protect the library against inaccurate information? Um, and I Sometimes, yeah, so what I would say is it's the United States of America. So anybody can sue anybody for anything, right? And then that's typically decided on merits. Let's just look at AI from the standpoint of other things, the internet. Okay, you provide access to the internet. Um, you provide access to databases. Um, you have all sorts of different books on your shelf of varying degrees of accuracy, right? So to me, that's just more of the same that we already do. 
I would just maybe caution that you're not presenting it as like, you know, this is the word of God from chat GPT. Um, but yeah, it's it, oftentimes it feels new, but when we think about it, it's not necessarily new from the standpoint of providing access to a tool or for information. Um, although typically when something is new, we do approach it with a degree of caution. Um, I'm sure if we look at our old internet policies, we were probably very cautious about how we presented it to the public. So, you know, sometimes standard disclaimer goes a long ways and just saying like, hey, you know, if, if I'm presenting, this is my computer with AI tool for the public to ask their question, I would say, please be aware that AI tools are imperfect, they're prone to hallucination, standard disclaimer. Uh, and I'm saying that as a non-lawyer. Okay, there's no more questions currently in the Q&A, but there were a number that were submitted prior to the workshop. Um, and there are several related to ethical considerations um, for library workers and AI. Um, how do we ensure AI being used by staff or patrons is being held to some ethical standards? Uh, what are the con ethical considerations for library workers using AI? Um, and so forth. I don't know if you want to expand on that a little more than what you've already done. Yeah, so I think that the ethical space, when we talk about what should we be doing right now, I think part of that is the ethical debates we need to have. Because when we look at AI, there is a laundry list of concerns. And you can address them with policy. And I think you also, when you write policy, you have to say, is it enforceable? If it's not enforceable, you're wasting your time writing it. Um, but what are some of the concerns that are stickier for us or things like compensation? Um, you know, there's the whole debate. Is it, is it art? Is it theft? Is it, um, is the rights holder for a text to image generator compensated or not? Um, typically the answer is no. There's some services that the answer is yes, um, that they're building things that do this. Um, when we talk about privacy, privacy, I think is a great place to start for libraries because while AI is an unregulated space, privacy is a regulated space, especially as it pertains to libraries. We have things like the confidentiality of patron records. That's a great place to start and then look at the terms of services of something like ChatGPT. And that may inform that, hey, I use that or I don't use that. Or it may tell you, you can use it if you're not putting in personally identifiable information, patron records, those types of things. That can help you have that foundation and policy um, that's guided by professional ethics that can add clarity to staff on what they can and can't do because they don't know right now. There are no guardrails. Okay, do we as librarians have an opportunity to provide input in how AI products are being developed by vendors, both library centric and not, and how can that input be most effective? Yeah, so, well, most effective is always buy it or don't buy it, right? I mean, that's the only thing. At the end of the day, however well-meaning vendors are, they have a fiduciary duty, right? They're there to make money. Um, I have talked to vendors who, you know, they're pitching ideas and stuff, and I, I tend to, like, tell them, like, about the professional ethics we have. Like, we're very concerned about privacy. We're very concerned about intellectual property. We're concerned about the accuracy of information and the you know, the transparency behind it. Where is the info coming from? How does it connect to the user? Um, all of those things. I, I feel like I have answered that question. I'm also, at the same time, I'm looking on my phone because I have a link I wanna drop in because um, it was a question about a, like a good AI primer. Um, so as soon as I find that too, I will drop that into the- uh... oh, yeah. Take your time. Oh, okay. so. There is a course, I'm not going to give the URL per se, but I will just say Google it. Um, so it's called the Elements of AI. Oh, I said to the hosts and panelists, I broke my own rule here. Okay. Uh, elements of AI, I believe that's from the University of Helsinki, which is a pretty comprehensive, like, hey, what is AI? How does it work? Um, that you can play with, and I think is very effective. 
MIT also has a course on uh, discerning fake news, um, on deep fakes and that sort of thing. That's pretty interactive. I see a question about uh, how can you tell that a book was written by AI technology? Um, one thing I would say is AI tools are very inaccurate at discerning AI generated content. They just tend to be inaccurate enough as to be rendered useless. Um, part of it relies on transparency and part of that may be the, you know, the uh, regulatory environment as it takes shape because we're seeing some progress there. For example, AI generated images, Google and a few other companies now are watermarking them at the point of creation. They're saying in the metadata, it's created by AI. You'd expect that sort of transparency from a publisher. For an unethical publisher, it's tough, right? You're gonna be looking at books. Um, you may have to rely on, is that part of the review sources that you're going to? Is that the standard they hold folks to? Is that they have to be published by a human? Because um, otherwise, what is it? Read it and just look for like really weird stuff. Okay, a question was submitted um, with the registrations that is related to the primer question that you just answered. Uh, and it's what tech or applications can we use to demo AI? Sure. Um, so I actually have a few things. On my website, I have a, uh, one of my blog posts is, um, and maybe I'll send that to you too, along with the, uh, the slides, but I have, there was a, a professor who put a, together a really nice virtual petting zoo. Um, it just has a whole list of AI tools to mess around with. Uh, it's nice. It's a little Google Doc. Excuse me. <laughs> it's a Google Doc. It's got a lot of stuff to play with. Um, so um, yeah, I'll probably just send that as a link separate. Uh, or if somebody wants to check my site, you'll, you'll find in one of the recent blog posts. Separately, I tend to go by functionality. Like I'm doing user groups right now with my staff and we settle on like, okay, let's look at a large language model. So we'll do chat GPT. Let's look at conversational search. So we'll use Bing or BARD. Um, let's look at text to image generators. We'll go to Canva. Um, or a Microsoft image generator. So hitting those broad functionalities is helpful. Then when you want something that's an all-in-one, my suggestion is to go to Gmail, create a burner Gmail, okay? It doesn't have to be uh, connected to you personally, and turn on um, the, um, what is it, uh, Google Labs, because then you can play with a whole suite of tools where it can read your email, um, it can search and you can talk to your email functionally. You can have a writing assistant. It's all one big ecosystem. Um, and that's where a burner Gmail is so easy to set up and just mess around with. That's a nice kind of workshop or lab for you to play with. Okay, and a question about um research GPT apps such as Consensus, have you used many of those? I have not. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very much a public librarian. I would say some of the AI infused tools I saw most recently was um, uh, Scopus AI, which may be out of beta now. It's very much like talking with chat GPT or even closer to Bing. And that one, it's citing like, the stuff it's it's talking to you conversationally about is has inline citations with um, its actual databases, peer review journals and whatnot. So that's something that is attractive to me and I'm not here to sell any, Elsevier has all the money on earth and they don't pay me anything. <laughs> um, but that is something that's closer to glass box, right? Where I know, okay, they have, what is the standard for inclusion in their database? Um, where is the source and links directly to it? That's along the lines of what we want to see. Okay, and here's a question. I can guess who it comes from. Um, if you have uh, suggestions for AI as it applies to marketing and communications. Um... Yeah, so I mean, what I would say is it tends to be an amalgam of tools. Um, you know that like, 
you know, you wear many hats as a marketer, okay? And some of it's investigative journalism just to see what's going on in your organization. So you can talk about it. Um, you know, you have text to image generators and that's something you have to feel out and see to what degree, um, you know, like Canva right now is such a creative suite of tools and they have text to image, they have text to video generators now for the first time. Um, so you can use those. You can play with copy. You can use a brainstorming uh, with something like ChatGPT and do marketing pitches and have that whole back and forth and discern, does this sound good? Does this help with copy? Some of the real aha moments for my staff are the ones who write newsletter and struggle with that tie-in sentence or a better way to phrase something. And not, surprising, not unsurprisingly, an LLM tends to do language very well. It does natural language processing. It's one of the things it does better than most things. Um, you know, I've used like a writing assistant now where I wish I had it before, where like my tie-in sentence, that first sentence on a post, you know that makes or breaks whether somebody clicks the link. Um, you can really go back and forth with AI and talk about what you're trying to communicate. Okay, great. I have some questions about whether the recording will be made available. Um, yes, we. I will process the recording and I will also distribute uh, Nick's slide. He has graciously agreed to share them with us along with a couple of the other links he mentioned today. That will um, not go out until next week. So uh, just watch your email inboxes for that and you will you will get that recording. Okay. Uh, all right, are there any other questions for today? Um, you can put them in the Q&A, you can put them in the chat. We, the links to the uh, attendance certificate and the program evaluation for today are also in the chat. Um, I encourage you to, if you have ideas for future events um, or speakers especially, to put those on the evaluations. That's how we actually get most of our programs. The ideas for our programs are from those evaluation um, suggestions, so. Um, and if I can just add to that, um, thank you, Susan, um, and thank you, Nick, for a wonderful presentation that gave all of us a, an overview. Um, as I meant, oh, Kathy, you somehow just muted yourself. Of course I did. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. <laughs> um, I also shared in the chat um, a link to our LibGuide um, for the AI and Libraries Committee, um, where you'll see a committee roster list. Um, you can reach out to any committee member. Um, you can reach out to Mike Palmino, the um, committee chair, or to anybody at CDLC. Um, we're interested in your ideas, as Susan mentioned, for CE, whether they are AI related or not. Um, you will also see on the LibGuide um, an upcoming program offered by LILRIC, which is one of our sister councils. Um, and Nick is going to be part of a panel discussion that, that on that, um, how libraries are using AI. Um, and I just wanted to mention, because there are so many of you here, that if you see any announcements from other library councils or anything from ESLIN, ESLN, the Empire State Library Network, you are all um, considered members of ESLIN through CDLC, if you're a CDLC member, or if your public library system or school library system is a member. So um, feel free to sign up for any ESLIN programs or any programs offered by our sister councils. Um, before we sign off, um, I wanted to um, thank Susan again. Um, she put the evaluation form in the chat multiple times. Please, um, we really value your feedback. Um, AI is new to us too. Um, we're learning. This is why we formed the committee at the recommendation of the Board of Trustees. And um, we're really interested in your ideas. And you might be using AI without even realizing it. Um, I've been playing around a little bit with a little bit with chat GPT. Uh, we also use Grammarly here at CDLC. Um, we've been using Canva. So um, if you are using AI in any way and would be interested in being on a very low key casual panel presentation in the spring, <laughs> no pressure, um, just to share with your colleagues in the Capital District how you're using AI, we would love to hear from you. Um, and as I also mentioned, we will be having a symposium in the fall focused on AI 
the planning committee is just getting started with what that agenda will look like. So if you have any ideas for topics or speakers, we would love to hear from you. Um, Nick, we will probably be reaching out to you again <laughs> um, okay. as a follow-up. Um, you gave us a lot to think about. Um, I encourage you all to um, share your experiences with AI, um, with CDLC, you know, reach out to one of us um, and let us know what, what we can do to support you. And we do um, have a few more minutes. We have one more question. Okay. Oh, sorry, Kathy, did you have? No, no, I was just going to thank Nick, but um, go okay. ahead, Susan. Um, it was, will hallucinations always be part of AI? And will AI learn that they are, that these are invalid? So or will we I learn. Guess, <laughs> yeah, I mean, my first assumption is yes, right? As long as there's generative AI, there will be hallucinations. Um, and just to be clear, it's a really technical term for saying it makes stuff up. It just... <laughs> A good example is uh, there was a lawyer who got in a lot of trouble because he used AI to make up case law. Um, he was making a legal argument and the AI made up fake cases that didn't exist and got caught on it. Um, so kind of like Better Call Saul, but like in the age of AI, right? Um, to the second part of that, that is one of the concerns is like what happens if AI starts citing AI, right? Um, and so that's one of the great unknowns. That's where walled gardens, think of like your databases can maybe be more uh, um, secure in that sense. That it's not the wild west, it's a closed data set with provenance of information and there's not a self-reinforcing cycle. Um, but again, that's me, big flashing sign that says that's my opinion there. Um, yeah, that's what I would leave off with there. I also see somebody talking about, uh, you know, uh, waiting for their school library to uh, to issue a document. Now, uh, I was giving a presentation on AI and like maybe like 10 minutes before uh, Joe Biden had dropped like this giant executive order on artificial intelligence. And I was thrilled about that. But that executive order has the potential to be very consequential, but it needs to be understood that it's a plan to make up a plan. Um, it's directing federal agencies to take certain actions. Um, one of the consequential ones for schools is going to be that the Department of Education needs to have a toolkit on the use of AI in schools um, and one that addresses things like algorithmic bias, for example. Um, so there's more certainty coming. Um, it's just probably a year off because um, when you tell somebody they have a year to develop a plan, usually they take a year to develop a plan. Um, and that's where, in that gap, that's the great place to figure out some policy, to figure out the, you know, the ethical debates, and to figure out um, how these tools work with safe experimentation. Um, thanks, Nick. I'll just um, add to that while you were talking at the federal level. Um, there was an announcement recently that there's um, a study going on now with state libraries and how they are using AI, um, and the New York State Library has signed on. Um, they're just getting started, so there's no report yet, but we will keep you updated um, as information comes out of the New York State Library. Yeah, I mean, to give you a sense of how they're playing catch up. You know, August 30th, the U.S. Uh, Copyright Office was like, hey, we hear people have some concerns about AI and copyright. And they, they opened up public comments and then have more recently closed and begun to respond. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of catch up taking place right now. And copyright is one topic. We are interested in offering a program specifically on copyright and AI. Um, we do have a couple of leads, but if anybody has any suggestions for speakers, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, um, Susan, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Uh, no, I'm all set. This was a wonderful program. Thank you, Nick. Um, if people have any issues with getting the CE certificate, they can contact me at susan at cdlc.org. Um, but otherwise, we hope to see you at a future CDLC program. Yes, um, and if you go to cdlc.org, you'll see our continuing education calendar, and you can sign up for any programs there. So um, thank you very much, Nick, for um, introducing AI to CDLC members. Um, I think it gives a good foundation for the committee um, and for us to, to think about what we can be doing within our region. Okay, thank you. So stay, stay safe down there. I Enjoy the snow. I'm going to go the driveway. <laughs>